Hello, and thank you for listening to Renewables, a podcast by Biostar, which aims to explore the current and future energy landscape in America. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Renewables. I'm your host, David Smart, and very excited to have Nick Rolater with us today, co-founder of Climate Commodities. Nick, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, yeah. Excited to talk about what you do um, very much in the thick of uh, the energy transition, I would say. So I think our listeners and viewers will find a lot of good insights here. Uh, I'm certainly looking forward to it. Uh, thank you to our listeners and viewers for se- tuning into this season. Uh, it's it's going to be a great season. We have a lot of good episodes coming up. But without further ado, uh, let's talk about you, Nick. Talk about climate commodities. And before we kind of dig into the business, tell our listeners and viewers about your background and your journey and how you got to where you are today. Absolutely. So as I'm Nick Oliter. I'm the co-founder of Climate Commodities. Um, so my background, just going back to to the beginning, uh, I'm from Tulsa, Oklahoma originally. I grew up in a family that's been in the oil, gas, and coal industry for a little over 75 years in that part of the country. Um, so my introduction to the energy and natural resources industry started very young. Um, growing up, you know, I did just about every manual labor job that you don't want to do when you're a kid growing up in Oklahoma and don't have soccer or football practice. Um, so I worked, um, you know, odd random odd jobs, uh, all through high school for my family's business and then really caught the bug for alternative energy as a part of that. Um, and a lot of that, you know, is just, I kind of learned, you know, how it worked in the oil field, learned how the oil and gas industry worked and really thought you're going to be doing this 30, 40 years from now. Um, I really need to get educated on perhaps where this is going. And so um, ended up going to school for alternative energy technology and finance at Columbia University, uh, doing graduate school at UPenn and then at Oxford. Um, and so my professional career took me into the hedge fund industry where um, I focused on, let's call it at the time, you know, ESG has been characterized alternative energy as a variety of different things, but really what we kind of looked at is new industrial. So I, in that, in that role, I really wanted to be at that point in my career an inch deep and a mile wide, you know, covered everything from solar to batteries to hydrogen to carbon capture to critical minerals to waste to value. It really gets to learn a lot about these businesses. Um, and then, you know, took the entrepreneurial journey starting in 2019. And so, um, you know, we set up Climate Commodities and we've had a couple of iterations since then with the idea of really working with operators in unloved areas that are critical to this energy transition and translating some of that technical factory floor expertise back to the financing side of the house and leading out our expertise um, as as investors. And so um, we've had a couple of iterations and we've we've set up a couple businesses, sold a few businesses and where we are today, um, our flagship platform is a critical minerals processing development company. Um, We're building a two phase project in Mississippi and in the process of acquiring a series of logistics assets. Um, We run a renewable power business um, that just focuses on building solar plus storage assets uh, for municipalities, um, large corporates, and a couple of other um, genres as well. And then we operate um, an insurance business that focuses on heavy industry, um, utility, uh, petrochemical refining, and the broader industrial sector specialty coverages. Um, And then we focus on, uh, we have one other platform that just does outbound sales, uh, mostly for commodity industrial businesses. Um, You know, the idea there is that, you know, we own, run, and operate an outsource sales force that is specialized to this industry to allow um, you know your sales engineer, one of your professionals, to focus on understanding the underlying business and delivering on appointments that we set for you as a high velocity sales force. And so that's kind of the four legs of the stool: um, critical minerals, power, insurance, uh, product marketing, and that's where we are today. And a lot of that has just been on the basis that, you know, we really believe from our experience on the hedge fund side, uh, meeting a lot of industrial businesses in the US, if we're going to execute on this reindustrialization and really reimagination of our infrastructure. A lot of these unloved areas have to have young people. So we've really focused on getting young people excited about industrial minerals processing, industrial equipment, um, utilities, insurance, um, cold calling, you know, these are all things that we need that, you know, there's not a, a really solid pipeline of young people that are exiting school looking to do. You've got a few things going on, uh, is what you're saying. And um, you're kind of working in various sectors of this climate economy, right? 
Um, talk a little bit more about, I guess, the founding of Climate Commodities and and um, how you view, you know, your role in in supporting the climate economy. I, I think that, you know, when we first got going, you know, our, our, our core idea, um, as I touched on a bit prior, was that there are a series of industrial sectors that have to come back to the U.S., industrial mm-hmm. minerals critical minerals, um, the supply chain supporting the power industry, um, and, you know, arguably a lot of um, specialty chemicals areas as well. And so, you know, our, our core thesis when we started was that, you know, coming from a financing seat, you're, you're really in a position where you look at a wide variety of ideas. And so what we saw repeatedly was a lot of really interesting industrial businesses in the gut of the country in the U.S. that had attractive economics, a large moat around their business, and a workforce that was between the ages of 55 and 70 with limited potential for young people to step into the seat to the next mm-hmm. generation. And so what we really looked at it is that you know, a lot of times these businesses, they either, you know, you can replicate them, you can partner with them. Like there's a lot of different ways to to address this. What we really focused on is attracting people to those sectors and equipping them with access to capital and the proper infrastructure to be successful. So, you know, focusing primarily on infrastructure development platforms, you know, the first phase of that is getting one or two people that know the factory floor or how the industry or the infrastructure development side works stem to stern, and then packaging that up to explain it in layman's terms to Wall Street, right? And to access capital for really what is um, more industrial entrepreneurship versus traditional technology entrepreneurship that where most venture and growth capital is allocated towards. And so, you know, we our core thesis was that like there is a need for someone who can take these critical areas of our industrial ecosystem, starting with critical industrial minerals, and translate how those businesses work and where they fit into a financial investor's portfolio and how supporting that kind of industrial entrepreneurship is critical to the goals that we're trying to achieve, you know, as a country. Um, one for employment, two for defense purposes. And so that that's really the the core basis that we started on. And on top of that, you know, our team um, comes from a variety of institutional backgrounds spanning. Uh, and I, my background is in running infrastructure projects. Um, and a couple of other team members come from large commodity shops. And, you know, a lot of the tools that opened up and brought oil and gas markets and some metals markets to where you see them today, um, we believe can be applied to some of these up and coming esoteric commodity areas that are becoming increasingly critical for this energy transition. And so that that was kind of our core tenet and thesis. Um, and we put together the team to execute on it. And we have you know, been doing this for a number of years now. And so, um, you know, that's kind of the founding story and what really, like, I think when you start a business, you got to have kind of a, a, a North Star, right? Because inherently you're going to have, as you know, a thousand iterations, right? Which, iterating is great. Right, you have to adapt and evolve, but like a lot of people get broken down by things going wrong in the midst of that, or just in general as a business owner, you have a lot of things that go wrong that it wears on you. And I think that that factor of fighting through that and then sticking to that that North Star component, you can get you know one person, a team of people, and then a couple of younger employees excited around that. That's really what like, that's what we did, and that's what I think separated us from other people who have tried to do this. Interesting. I love the focus on the next generation as well. And I assume when you talk about some of the kind of emerging technologies, you're talking about hydrogen, you're talking about carbon capture. I think you have experience in both of those spaces. Um, Talk about, you know, your perspective on this transition to net zero, right? Uh, Especially for companies in the oil and gas space. Uh, I just interested in, in your perspective on What does that really look like? What does the future look like? Um, And what technologies, you know, do we need to kind of get us to where we want to go? So it's it's interesting. I think if you're, you know, if if you're if you're an oil and gas company, um, or there's there's kind of three areas that that or two areas, I guess we've we've taken a look at. So in the oil and gas space, you know, you have to there's the upstream component. The, uh, the midstream component and the downstream component. I think that in looking at the energy transition, depending on where your core competency is, you have to figure out, you know, are you going to look at this from a resource exploitation perspective, a resource transportation perspective, or a resource transformation perspective? And so, you know, it, w- within that 
construct if you think about the carbon capture component, right? Like the carbon capture component, it fits in well to the resource exploitation um, portion of the ecosystem broadly, right? I think that companies that, you know, really understand downhole geology and have been on that side of the industry for a long period of time are positioned well to participate holistically in the carbon capture utilization and storage emerging ecosystem, just based on the transferability um, of the skill sets. I think, you know, shifting to the midstream component, um, you know, there's, there's a couple of different areas there. I think that, you know, when you look at, you know, hydrogen, kind of the emerging alternative fuels ecosystem and what it serves, right? You have, you know, ammonia fertilizer markets, um, you have existing chemical industrial processes that could use a greener um, input, depending upon, you know, just for preference, reference, you've got your green hydrogen, which is effectively produced through electrolysis, electricity and water, blue hydrogen, which is produced from a steam methane refilling process of natural gas into the steam methane former hydrogen out. And the blue portion of it comes from having a carbon capture attachment that captures the carbon. Um, and then you know, you've got now there's turquoise and a couple of other types of hydrogen that where you have hydrogen derived from a waste product. Um, and so the, the vast majority of that's going to be blue and green hydrogen. And so there is some case to displace existing hydrogen demand that exists in the chemical and industrial sectors by having just pure greener product. Um, the issue here and where I think that a midstream oil and gas company can position itself quite well is that the economics of the hydrogen space and the demand is not it's coming, but it's not fully there yet. And so when you look at the midstream component, um, unlocking demand through um, economically advantaged transportation, um, which you, were, you can't put, you can blend hydrogen in a pipeline right now, but you have to have an outright dedicated um, piece of infrastructure to transport it at scale. Um, you know, the trucking ecosystem is, is somewhat there. I think that you know there is a huge play there um, to be involved in opening up new markets by being a transportation counterpart there for that part of the that part of the industry, and that's what they know, right? That's what the people who who you know the service ecosystem on the equipment side. Um, the people at the infrastructure operators, like there is skill set uh, crossover there can be utilized. Um, you know, on the downstream side of the house resource transformation, um, a lot of these companies are using hydrogen already. Typically, um, gray hydrogen, which is the, the dirtier <laughs> hydrogen produced through natural gas, steam methane reformer, um, hydrogen out without any carbon capture component, that in most refining complexes, which are effectively micro economies, you know, hydrogen's already sold over the fence and utilized. And so, um, you know, that part of the ecosystem, you know, looking more towards, you know, an Exxon Mobil, right? Um, you know, that the resource transformation side, I think, is really looking at where is the demand center going to come from, you know, and how do you utilize this product um, if it is going to be at scale in this energy transition and this part of the, part of the ecosystem, right? Both inside the refinery and also in transportation applications. So the, the the issue I think you have on the demand side is the the other area that's emerging is heavy duty transportation. So if you have a class A truck, um, you've got roughly 10 tons of batteries to power that or roughly 60 kilograms of hydrogen. And so there's a huge weight advantage. And also, you know, hydrogen, this is a fueling system. So it could come back to base, fuel up in, you know, three or four minutes versus, you know, four hours of charging. And so there's a big advantage there. Um, the issue is that you know, there's not a huge ecosystem of, it's a chicken of the egg, right? The, 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 the hydrogen powered vehicles don't exist at scale. And the companies that do it that are doing this are small to mid-sized startups that don't have substantial credit worthiness. So the, what's really needed there is, you know, a meeting, and that's what the most critical thing is the demand side, right? Is a meeting of the minds of a, a an oil and gas, integrated oil and gas group already participating substantially in the traditional fuels market, working with you know, most of these trucks, right? If you were to build a fleet um of hydrogen powered vehicles. You know, the, the best thing you could do is get a contract with Walmart, with Costco, one of these groups, and you know, really thinking strategically alongside the finance community, like what are the mechanisms through which you can look through to, you know, a Costco lease of one of these one of these um, fleets, right? And then build the infrastructure on site back to base to, to suit it. So, you know, the, the mechanism to enable that ecosystem is not fully baked on the demand side, but the skill sets up and down um, the oil and gas value chain um, exists 
Um, and I think just outside of that, I touched briefly, you know, we've also looked at um, what are you know the opportunities for companies in the coal sector participate in um, the broader energy transition value chain. You know, we, we think that hydrogen is not their place. Um, you know, we, we think that it's more um, support, depending upon the nature of their coal business, um, supporting the industrial and critical minerals ecosystem. As you know, coal, people forget, is you know, a metals and mining um, core, core business per its classification. Um, and then in some cases, supporting uh, emerging power uh, technology businesses as well. Yeah, we've got a good episode on uh, hydrogen transportation with a company called Vern uh, H2, Ted and Bab. Those guys are awesome. I don't know if you've heard of them, um, but but that was, I think, back in the 40, episode 41. So if anybody's interested in learning more about that, go check it out. Um, really, you, you know, interesting perspective. And um, I think I want you to talk a little bit more. We talk a ton about energy on this show and renewable energy and, and ways to transition to renewable energy. Talk more about the building material side um, and the, the mineral side, uh, because, you know, creating a lot of renewable energy is good, but how do we, you know, make uh, just using building materials as one example, right? make these products more sustainable. And, and that's such an important part of the equation. Talk a little bit about that. So, you know, our, so going through a couple areas, you know, our whole, we have a whole platform that focuses on industrial minerals and critical minerals, right? And so just at, at a base level, most people think about critical minerals and they think, you know, electric vehicles, energy transition, you know, lithium, cobalt, nickel, graphite, rare earths, copper. Um, when in reality, you know, the industrial minerals ecosystem that underpins you know, everything in this office I'm in, everything in the office you're in, you yeah. know, our what we do day to day, our cars, um, our devices, you know, that is actually the largest component of U.S. mine production. Um, and a lot of these minerals have been forgotten and are processed and distributed out of China now. Um, and so, you know, it, it's it, it's it's interesting. I, I think that there's a, there's a couple of things there. One. Um, we used to do this in the United States and the broader Western world. And so I, I think the, the first step here is these, 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 these minerals have applications, and as you mentioned, building products, which translates into critical infrastructure, national defense, and now this other demand center that is the energy transition. Um, you know, one of the problems that you have in, in some of these markets is that you know, they're, they're somewhat antiquated, antiquated, right? Like, the, when, when you look at an esoteric commodity, there may be a, a, a listed highly liquid feedstock supply that goes into a proven technology that has a very illiquid esoteric commodity output. And so, you know, for a financial investor, it is somewhat challenging to underwrite supporting the construction of these projects without some sort of overarching guarantee. So you know, there is a process knowledge that's embedded in there and just understanding how to deal with um you know, these businesses, these materials style the contracts appropriately. And that's where we position ourselves. Um, I think that, you know, the other issue that, that, that you deal with here is that you have traditionally, um, you know, industrial minerals by design, and critical minerals to a certain degree too, are, you know, low value, high volume commodities used in industrial processes that support basic life, basic materials. And so what you've had, in, you know, looking at, um, you know, nickel is a really good example of this. You know, traditional industrial input material um, whole new demand center. You know, if you look at the nickel demand 15 years ago, maybe 10% of it was energy transition related uh, matters. You know, now that's the vast majority of the demand, right? Yep. And so the, the issue you have here is you have historically sleepy um, mineral ecosystems that were outsourced from the Western world to China, now becoming increasingly important for a multitude of applications, plus this overarching energy transition. And, you know, they don't work the same as, as you know, we're used to um, the power industry, right? Like you, you don't get a 20 year contract to sell an industrial mineral, right? You get, you know, the way it works in China is you get a three month, a six month, a one year contract, and then probably a lot of just in time sales out of your facility. Whereas, you know, US and Western European um, renewable power and climate investors where the bulk of the investment has been done to date are used to 15, 20 year um, you know, pretty close to fixed price um, or index based contracts to take a lot of risk out of the infrastructure. And so mm -hmm. you, you're really dealing with 
you know, through this industrialization and bringing this back to the U to the U.S. Um, and really building and rebuilding our industrial backbone, like you have a business concept that is a cross between an infrastructure project and really an industrial factory, right? Because uh, if you were, you know, think about it, you ran a plant and someone said, hey, if you want a more sustainable product, you have to sign a 20 year contract. You can't fix your cost structure out if you're dealing with steel or automotives or a, a razor thin margin industry. And so you know, what we believe is that um, there's a couple of different things here. The sustainability component re relies first on, I want to make sure I holistically adjust the question here. So that's the market piece. The sustainability portion comes from everything starts with the cleaner electrons, right? So you start with renewable power in and out, in, throughout your organization. In facility design, you start with thinking about, okay, is there a mechanism through which on a cost-effective basis, which is available and most, most engineering firms can do this for a closed loop system inside the facility. And then looking at your contracts, both on the offtake side, but more importantly on the supply side, if you're running a conversion process, um, to what degree can I use either um, partial and partial or in whole um, materials derived from waste to enhance that circularity? And so, you know, I think that what the, the journey that we've had um, just from the days in the hedge fund side until now is really educating ourselves on how these markets work that are coming back from China and then how to style them to have um, net zero power, um, the uh, closed loop circular design internally, and then to utilize uh, feedstocks derived from waste where able, because that is not being done in, in China. Um, you have limited permitting, um, oversight, coal power usage, uh, runoff um, allowed, and you know, largely virgin material used in these facilities. So you, you said something I think is interesting there that that is not being done in China and there's probably not as much of a focus on being sustainable, being closed loop, using renewable inputs, right? Um, and I think that kind of ties back. I've, I've asked this question a lot recently on the show. Kind of ties back to, I think, for everyday consumers, it can be a bit daunting to think about this, about what can I really do here to help right um especially when you look at you know the u.s comparatively actually does a pretty good job of and has done a pretty good job of adopting renewables and and being more sustainable so all that to say what, what role do you think uh everyday consumers can play in supporting you know renewable energy initiatives this idea of transitioning um and what's the best way for them to get involved you know, it's, it's it's actually pretty interesting. I, I think that you know, from my from my perspective, um, you know, I, most people are, are busy people, right? Like you, you think that like that, that's probably not the first thing you wake up every day thinking about, right? And so, you know, I I believe that the most impactful thing that someone can do, obviously, there are things you can do at home. Right? You can recycle. Um, you know, if it is applicable to you, you can electrify your home. You can electrify your transportation on a day to day basis, but. I think that the most important thing you can do over the long term, depending upon your circumstances, you know, is to direct your investments to the degree that you're able. You know, most people save and put, you know, first and fifteenth of the month a portion of that money into the stock market, into other investments. And I, I think the the biggest vote for sustainability that you can put forth um, is pooling your dollars with others, because that is a domino effect into investing in the sustainability related matters, whether it be power, hydrogen, um, carbon capture, critical minerals, reshoring, whatever trend that, that, that you, that, that you see fit, you know, even though we do have some good momentum in the capital markets of the, of, for, for these sectors are still being developed. And on the earlier side, hydrogen, critical minerals, they're at a really early stage. And the importance, as you've seen over the last few years, I and mean, there's whole movies on this now, um, the significance that a pool of just everyday investors can have. Um, on a company and industry or more broadly, and then the regulatory access they have to some of these investments um, is really unprecedented relative to other times um, in history has been individual participation. So I think that the biggest thing that you can do um, is direct your your savings towards um, matters that you believe to be um, important from an investment perspective, because that, like, that trend, if it catches on in certain communities, like you, you can see how because um, if there's if there's broader access to capital and the capital market goes mainstream for a lot of these um, things that are needed, 
the cost will inherently come down. Just as has been seen with the savings that have come from the solar power industry and having cheaper access to capital just even in the last 10 years has been a remarkable um, reduction in costs. And part of that is due to manufacturing efficiencies, but the biggest part um, is due to a large, I think a large part is due to the maturity of capital markets and the financing community for that ecosystem. And I think that it's really important to think about over the next 10 years, the role the individual investor plays in that, no matter how small. Well, I like that answer. It's different than a uh, different answer than what I've heard in the past. I like that. You, you mentioned things you can do at home, but uh, transition investing, right? No longer ESG investing, according to Larry Fink, uh, transition investing now. So I like that answer. Um, you are a former 30, uh, Forbes 30 under 30 honoree in the energy category. You're an adjunct lecturer at uh, UPenn, I believe. And uh, you have, I guess, through that, you know, access to emerging talents in, in our industry. Uh, and you've talked a little bit about at the top of the show about the importance of, you know, getting this next generation involved in these technologies, these solutions, which I think is really interesting. But what advice would you give to young professionals who are aspiring to make a difference in sustainability, aspiring to get into this industry and starting their careers? Well, it's it, it, it's interesting, and actually, back to the the Vern thing. That's I I, I remember those guys. We're all in the same list. That's a, that's a small room. It's oh, nice, place. awesome. But, but it's it's uh, so going back, um, you know, lot. There's a, there's a couple of things. I think from my perspective, um, one of the things I find really interesting about the energy technology alternative energy ecosystem is that you know, any other industry you're in, right? You want to be, you know, go to Wall Street, be a bond trader. You know, be an investment banker. There's so many like there's so many paths you could you could take there. And a lot of young people I find from teaching this class are drawn to starting their career on Wall Street, which is a great place to start. But the 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 thing that's really interesting is that when you get into the pure play energy technology ecosystem, especially some of the areas we're in, there's not someone who's 70 years old. It's like no, 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 no. This is how we did it. Like I know the way to do. It. I've been doing this for a long time. Like this is how this works. Like mm. you're writing the book yourself, and so. You know, I, I think that what I see and what I kind of guide, you know, I teach the climate technology finance class at UPenn. Um, and it's actually really interesting because a huge portion of the the students are international students, which is really interesting because you get a wide variety of perspectives on how this energy transition is going and also based on just where someone just originates from, like what is most important to them, right? You know, is it solar power? Is it waste? Um, you know, is it, it's very interesting to see. And, you know, I think that, for young people, the and, you know, academia and the broader corporate ecosystem often makes entrepreneurship very, very daunting. Um, and I think that's very incorrect, given the fact that in this sector, we need more young people, we need more entrepreneurs, and we need people to realize that there's not like you're not entering an industry where there's, you know, a thousand, even two thousand people over the age of seventy that can tell you, like, "Hey, we've done this for all this time. Like, here's the mentorship path. Here's the way you go." Like that, that's being constructed in real time, and they, I find that extremely exciting because, as you know, as a young person, um, you know, there are just enough tools over the last few years to really equip yourself um, just through self self starterness, like as an independent individual on you know, solar batteries, hydrogen, critical minerals, like the whole ecosystem of what do you find interesting? What kind of businesses are available? You know, like for a young person, like one thing we do in the, in the class I teach is most young people have never read um, a tin can of a US listed company. And it's like, you know, if you read 150 10Ks a year or like, you know, one a week, you know, just get into a good cadence of that, you know, there's a PhD in a lot of sectors embedded within that. because they have to explain their business soup to nuts. And I think that what I try to say is, hey, look, if you're interested in this, right, like what you've got to do is broadly educate yourself on what kind of companies are available. What are they doing to address this? How does their business model work? And then figure out, you know, do you want to do you want to start your career like me and be a mile wide and an inch inch deep? Or do you want to dive in wholly to one of those businesses? And that's kind of the side the, the side of um, is it are you going to go work for an operating business? Are you going to go to Wall Street, right? Yep. Um, or, or try to work in a in a capacity where you know you're looking at hundred businesses and and rotating through services, or are you just every day like building a piece of infrastructure, kind of in the midst of it? So I think that 
a, a lot of people don't receive the guidance of like how that journey works and they end up pivoting a bunch because like that core piece of do you want to start where do you want to start right because that will determine your ultimate outcome um yeah i think that's the that's the core thing and i always kind of advise people like use academia when you have the chance as your lab because you can't get anything wrong right like you get in the real world you know that's a whole different yeah, the 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 consequences for a poor test are far different but in that situation you can really test what you may or may not like to do on a database which is the most important thing and then figure out as a person from a risk perspective how comfortable you are with the concentrated versus diversified portfolio of work on a daily basis it's really good advice very insightful thank you for that and i uh, really appreciate you coming on the show it's been a pleasure getting to know you and learn more about you and your business um as we kind of wrap up here i want to give you first a question any big announcements uh any earth shaking announcements that we can debut on the renewables podcast so r r right now you know we, we've got um at, at the moment we do not have any any huge announcements that we can we can debut on here uh, unfortunately <laughs> well i hope uh when you do you will let us you know keep us posted on what you're up to and we have lots of repeat guests on the show so uh, let's definitely stay in touch and and excited to see you know, where you take this thing with climate commodities. And uh, it seems like you're on a pretty impressive path thus far. So really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing that with our listeners and viewers. And if our listeners and viewers heard something they want to learn more about, uh, what's the best way to, to find you online and get in touch? Uh, best way to find me is on LinkedIn, to be honest. I okay. answer all messages and uh, I'm pretty excellent there. Awesome. Nick, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, to our listeners and viewers, thank you for tuning in week after week. You make this thing possible. This has been another episode of Renewables. I'm your host, David Smart. Thanks for tuning in. Hello, and thank you for listening to Renewables, a podcast by Biostar, which aims to explore the current and future energy landscape in America.